So Good I was morning wondering if you could tell Rico. us a bit more about the inspiration uh, My name is Amir Safar, uh, and I'll be discussing my presentation, Osiris and Anubis in Space, Zelazny's Creatures of Light and Darkness. This particular text is a creation of author Roger Zelazny. It concerns the conflict between life and death, presented to the reader as a conflict between Anubis and Osiris, who use champions in a proxy war to decide the ruler of the universe. Zelazny is no stranger to using myths and science fiction. He was fond of using allegories and imagery from disparate myths in his stories. Prior examples include the utilization of Hindu myths in Lord of Light and Greek myths in This Immortal. Each text combined mythology with science fiction. For example, Lord of Light had humans advancing technology to the point that they assumed the positions of the gods whose names they invoked. Creatures of Light and Darkness, by contrast, relies heavily on the myth aspect, with science fiction serving as the backbone for the story. This particular text was a strange one, as Zelazny used it as a test bed for different styles of ideas. Because of this, the text could transition wildly from traditional novel to poetry to stage direction and lines. It leads to the text having a very dreamlike quality which can make it hard to decipher at times. This is ironic because the actual plot is relatively simple. I would like you to notice that on the cover you see here on screen right now, Anubis is shown standing next to binary code in place of hieroglyphics. This is important as the binary relationship between life and death is at the heart of the novel. You may also notice that they are the number two after the one which is then followed by three, four, et cetera, et cetera. This is not a misunderstanding of binary code, but an intentional choice. The story is put into motion by Anubis and Osiris, who in this story run the house of the dead and house of the living respectively. Osiris in particular seems to be misplaced, being in charge of life, but he resents in the text life eternal, being able to make creatures immortal through science and magic. Anubis by contrast, seems to fit into his purpose as Lord of Mummification, often performing his services to various characters. However, both deities are antagonistic forces manipulating other gods in an attempt to usurp the other. Anubis uses a champion named Joaquin, who in the text is actually set, has lost his memory. Meanwhile, Osiris uses his son Horus, both gods using their champions in an attempt to assassinate Toth, and secure his throne. Horus and Set are the active protagonists in the text, traveling from world to world in search of Toth in order to kill him. Both of them competing with each other despite having never met. Zelazny uses traditional relationships in myth to set the conflict, often keeping the character traits as close to the myth as possible, with Horus being the closest to being a heroic figure in the text often horrified by the universe he finds himself in, locked in a war between life and death and science and magic, and more importantly, binary. The reason for this is the cosmology of the universe they reside in, which relies on the power of binary code. Binary code, as most of us know, is simply the be be bedrock of computer code, zeros and ones. But instead of zeros and ones, Zelazny use, uses zeros and two, Anubis and Osiris keep the universe in balance by keeping worlds from not having an overabundance of either life or death. If a world has too much life, that is to say the world is close to Osiris's domain, a plague may strike to curb the population. If a world has no life close to Anubis, a meteorite might strike the planet, producing bacteria that can survive there, which will result in an increase in life. Anubis himself directly attributes to this and, and attributes it to the nature of zero and two. As he notes, quote, can life be counted upon to limit itself? No, it is the mindless striving of two to become infinity. Can death be counted upon to limit itself? Never, it is the equally mindless effort of zero to encompass infinity. The idea of two was especially prominent as sex and love often serve to push characters forward to self-destructive acts. It is the pursuit of two the pursuit of love and life, which pushes characters such as Horus and Osiris forward. 
One particular example of life out of control is the planet Bliss. Joachim is sent there to search for Toth, and in doing so, finds a world full of life. Too much life. Bliss's technology has gotten to the point that disease and death have been conquered. The only things that seem to matter is breeding and entertainment. Citizens are obsessed with creating more life to break the monotony of long lives, which do not end. It is the exaggerated state of overpopulation, the life eternal that comes after death in Egyptian myth. It is on bliss that the immortal gods hide because they are indistinguishable from normal humans. Uh, death has become a perversion on bliss as the concept of ceremony and funeral rites have become a sideshow. Individuals treat suicide the same way we treat carnival shows, selling tickets to a man's self-immolation, with his death being treated with skepticism to the point the audience claims the death was faked and are ignorant on how a person would die in the first place. The import, proper treatment of the dead occurs often in the story, with bodies and corpses being mistreated or abused, often comedically. Uh, the implication being that the gods have become so irresponsible and lazy that even the handling of the dead has been perverted. The mutilation of the body is exemplified by the oracles and soothsayers throughout the story. Osiris's son, Horus, goes to two distinct types of oracles throughout his quest. One magical, the other mecha mechanical, scientific. The first is a Haruspex named Freydag, who uses entrails to read the future. In order to see the future for a god, Freydag uses the entrails of a rival Haruspex. Much to the man's annoyance, Freydag is incompetent, however, at both cutting and reading the entrails, forcing the dying Horuspex to read his own entrails in order to give Horus the information he needs. The mechanical oracle is what's referred to, the, to as a sex comp, a computer powered by a human that requires sexual gratification in order to provide knowledge. In this case, it's often done without the human's consent. They're usually put in there as punishment. And in one part of the case, the one woman is found in there heavily pregnant. The implication being that she was impregnated while being a sex cop. In both cases, magical and scientific, the body is violated, often without hesitation in order to pursue knowledge. And Horus is understandably horrified by both having been kept by his father's side for most of his life. The integration of old myths of fortune telling with technology as a form of search engine highlights a text union of flesh and machinery. The body being defiled is not just delegated to oracles and search engines. Characters are often mutilated and de defiled, resulting in horrific descriptions of the body, often hearkening back to mummification and Egyptian myth. Anubis's champion Joaquin is the most overt. Joachim, as mentioned previously, is the, actually the amnesiac set, who in this story is, in spite of being a destroyer figure, still the hero. Joachim's body is molded through technology to be more powerful in order to kill Toth, but it is the nature of his modification which invokes Set's involvement with the Osiris myth. Joachim has his arms and legs removed in order to replace them with machinery and is forced to mutilate and destroy his genitalia in order to become perfect in Anubis's eyes. This ties into Osiris's death and his own mutilation with his body being scattered and parted. However, his pieces were still considered perfect as opposed to Joachim, whose body is mutilated in order to induce perfection. Anubis then discusses the integration of machinery into the body and try, tying into the question of the self. If the body is completely machine, is the individual still alive? Which is something that Joachim cannot answer even at the end of the text. Compounding this dysphoria of self, Joachim is mutilated without knowing he is set, resulting in a furious God when his memory is restored. If Osiris' parts were beautiful in spite of being separate, then Anubis's mutilation of set is a true violation of the body, removing the perfect for a facsimile of perfection. Osiris himself commits acts of violation and mutilation, consigning individual, individuals to internal life, forcing an enemy into life as a carpet 
capable of feeling people literally walk over him. The gods seem to have lost their way, no longer respecting the body in any way and often ignoring or glorifying ceremony and tradition, such as Anubis preventing the dead from being interred properly and forcing them to engage in mindless orgies for his own amusement. Many of you may have noticed that when discussing the idea of oracles, I refer to a horospex, which is more of a Greek term, not an Egyptian one. Zelazny seems to enjoy introducing Greek myth into the story, often being in subservience of the Egyptian myth. The three fates appear as a species of alien that can see the future, but are often cannibalistic to their own species. The aforementioned horospex is portrayed as a serious job, but full of betrayal and death. But the most direct reference to Greek myth is Set's brother, Typhon. In terms of mythological function, Set and Typhon are both destroyers. Zelazny is aware of this and has Typhon be a literal shadow entity who only appears once Joachim is set loose into the world, into the light of life. Once the light appears, Typhon appears. He literally appears pages after Joachim is free, quite literally following his brother like a shadow. Typhon being a shadow allows Zelazny to utilize a scientific concept that at that point in history had only been theorized, the black hole. The text was published in 1969, with the first black hole being discovered in 1971, that being Cygnus X1. But even though it was still theoretical, the basic function of the black hole as an empty space where nothing can escape is commented on, with Typhon being feared by everyone but said because of his destructive nature. The black hole is even used to kill a monster in the climax of the text by forcing it through Typhon's body. Finally, Toth deserves a brief mention, being the target of assassination by nearly everyone in the story. In here, Zelazny reimagines him as both the father and son of Set, which is due to a specific ability both characters have, which is referred to as temporal fugue. It allows individuals to step out of time in order to have hyper-fast battles. This combined with black holes and their theoretical properties at the time, the Pantheon is presented as a paradoxical entity that should not exist and simultaneously does, simultaneously being zero and two. Dot Toth is the only one who appreciates this and attempts to end the conflict between Osiris and Anubis by replacing them with more caring rulers. He succeeds by the end by restoring Awakim to his being of Set. Anubis is replaced by a sorcerer that is a servant of Toth, and Osiris is replaced by his son Horus. Horus himself falls in love with a sex cub, and the two are expecting a child, resulting in the return of life or the return of two. Set, however, is forced to become a mindless entity, hunting more and more prey until he's inevitably destroyed. Set is reduced to zero. In closing, Creatures of Light and Darkness allows Zelazny to examine the unending conflict between life and death, the unchanging conflict between life and death, by portraying it in a binary fashion. The text begins and ends with zero and two, and the universe remains binary, just under slightly more aware management. And that's, nah, nah, I'm done. <laughs>